going to start with this slide. You know, everyone's talking about extension of the healthy human lifespan, the so-called health span, but what does that actually mean? So uh, we have an objective for all the clients and patients who come through HLI. It's that they live to the age of 128, and they die doing something they love, not of disease. And the question is, how are we going to get to that point? How do we get to the point where most of us are living healthily to the age of 100? I actually think we have that right in our hands. I think the new pill is you, as Dan said. I don't think it's necessarily going to be a new drug-eluting stent or a new chemotherapy regimen. Uh, I actually think it's going to be uh, data-driven AI that gets us to uh, that point. And you know, where we are right now is we have sick care, right? So if you think about bladder cancer, you know, the way that we find out if you have bladder cancer is you, know, you find that you have blood in your urine or hematuria, you go to your doctor, and you find out often too late that you have bladder cancer. I would argue that the next version of sick care, but moving towards well, well care, is pre-symptomatic diagnosis. The idea that using advanced data, MRI and genetics, we can find out pre-symptomatically you have that tumor long before it's too late. But the bottom line is you still had that tumor in the first place. And I think where we're moving with AI, the promise of AI, is that we can tell you about your risk for bladder cancer or Alzheimer's or coronary artery disease or diabetes one or five or 10 years before disease onset, and that if you do X, Y, and Z, you never get the disease in the first place. And I think that's how we get to a healthy human lifespan of 100 or above. And I would argue that the reason that, in general, AI has not moved the needle on the healthy human lifespan, because everyone's talking about AI, how it's going to change the practice of medicine, right? You go to any healthcare conference, JP Morgan included, AI, right? And I would argue the reason that it hasn't made a big uh, you know, impression on the clinical practice is we're not measuring what matters. And I love my Fitbit, and I love my Apple Watch, but it turns out if you really want to know about your condition now, and your risk for chronic age-related disease, you've got to go much deeper than that. You've got to measure what matters. So at HLI, we actually started a science experiment four years ago, and that was to enroll presumed healthy individuals to come into what we now call the health nucleus, and they underwent every test imaginable. Whole genome sequencing at 30x, whole body MRI, CT calcium scoring, microbiome, EKG, a number of other tests as well. And what we found, and the initial reason for doing the testing, by the way, was to explore the normal human variation in phenotype as a better way of understanding genotype, our own whole genomes. But what we discovered from these presumed healthy individuals was that they weren't so healthy after all. And in fact, 40% had clinically significant disease that wasn't previously known. One in 50, a new high-grade early-stage tumor, 2.5%, roughly 1 in 50, with brain or aortic aneurysms that weren't previously known. Almost 1 in 10 with advanced coronary artery disease that wasn't previously known. 30% with elevated liver fat, evidence for metabolic syndrome. And get this, on whole genome sequencing, nearly 1 in 4 have a rare genetic mutation, a rare monogenic variant like a BRCA mutation that affects the disease uh, of that patient individually. And these are just some examples, and this speaks to measuring what matters. You know, um, I wish we could get this data from a superficial sensor wearable, but we can't. So two women in their 30s with papillary thyroid cancer uh, that we caught early. And note that many of these findings are in folks under the age of 50. So often we think of cancer uh, you know, as something that strikes 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, but not necessarily, right? Uh, lung adenocarcinoma in a female patient, 54-year-old, no risk factors for lung cancer, a non-smoker. This was resected a week later. Not just tumors, brain aneurysms, grape-sized aneurysms like this that normally present with sometimes fatal brain bleeds. So this one was uh, resect or coiled a week later on an outpatient basis because we found it uh, before it ruptured. Advanced coronary artery disease, again, in an individual under the age of 50. At age 45, significant calcified plaque in the left anterior descending coronary artery that supplies the left ventricle. Turns out this individual had a LDL receptor mutation on whole genome sequencing, which explains uh, in part why she, at the age of 45, has coronaries that look like an 80-year-old. So again, it speaks to measuring what matters. And the overall summary, and by the way, this is uh, in review uh, and available in the preprint uh, biorepository bioarchives, the overall summary from the first 1,200 patients that we've had through, uh, and by the way, we've seen over 5,000 now, 
uh, is that 40% have clinically significant disease, 14% have clinically significant life-altering findings that weren't previously known. New tumors, new aneurysms, new rare monogenic uh, mutations like BRCA mutations. So, you know, at the end of the day, what we like to say is that we're building the story of you through our assessment, and we're, we're doing that by measuring what matters. You know, we're using data to drive decision support for nearly all other decisions in our lives, whether they're investment decisions, our car has a thousand sensors, our social media. Why are we not using deep data to drive decision support for health and wellness? Uh, and, you know, I think that's where the whole field of precision health and personalized medicine is moving. Everyone knows this book. If you have a company, a startup company you're using, measure what matters, you're using the OKR system. Why are we not measuring what matters for our own health and wellness? We should be. Uh, and I would argue that the fountain of youth is a reality, and it starts with data-driven AI. It starts with a fountain of data. And at the end of the day, a deep data-driven uh, precision health assessment allows you to know your condition now. Do I have that tumor or aneurysm? Do I have that rare monogenic variant? But more importantly, based on everything that I know about you, what's your risk, your one-year, five-year, ten-year risk for chronic age-related disease? And by the way, if that risk is elevated, what's the one, two, or three risk factors that you can modify uh, to get that risk down? And this is an example of uh, an imaging biomarker, imaging biomarkers that we derive from our whole body MRI. When I, when I socialize whole body MRI, most folks think about whole body CT that was popular so many years ago. Actually, the point of whole body MRI is not screening. It's to derive imaging biomarkers, continuous measurements of chronic age-related disease that we can integrate with genomic and blood biomarkers to give you a readout on your risk long before disease onset. So take diabetes or metabolic syndrome. It's important to know your liver fat, your visceral adipose tissue, because these are going to be elevated long before your hemoglobin A1C or fasting blood glucose. And it turns out that the biomarkers that are important for longevity are also important for your performance right now. So if your liver fat is elevated, if your visceral adipose tissue is elevated, believe me, you're not jumping out of bed in the morning, you're not as energetic at work or for your family as you could be. So human performance, high performance, and longevity are definitely tied. And at the end of the day, we're giving actionable health intelligence like this uh, to our patients and clients. And this really sums up not only our value proposition, but where we think the uh, field of precision health and personalized medicine is moving. Again, yes, you want to know about your risk, your condition now, but more importantly, you know, thankfully, most of the clients that come see us, they don't have an aneurysm or a tumor, but everyone leaves with this health intelligence, which is for dementia, can I show you what your risk is a year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now for mild cognitive impairment or dementia long before you have disease onset? It turns out that a third of the risk for Alzheimer's and most dementias is modifiable. It's in your control. So folks that say, I don't, know what, I don't want to know about my risk for dementia because there's nothing I can do about it, that's just simply not true. A third of the risk is modifiable. So what this allows us to do is take imaging biomarkers, genetic biomarkers like your APOE status, blood biomarkers, and put it all together to give you your eight-year pre-symptomatic uh, readout. And if your risk is elevated, what's the number one modifiable risk factor that we can use to get your risk down? And, you know, we know that there are six modifiable risk factors for dementia and mild cognitive impairment. That includes blood pressure, hypertension, BMI, visceral adipose tissue, elevation, alcohol use, and so on. And, you know, it's a very different conversation if I say to someone, you should lose weight or lower your cholesterol, versus, hey, we looked at everything we know about you, including your imaging and genetic biomarkers, and we show that you have elevated risk for dementia, and the number one modifiable risk factor is cholesterol. That's a whole different motivation and incentive for lowering that cholesterol. So the health nucleus is really a solution to this problem, which is that, unfortunately, in this country, and it's really a global problem, that if you live to the age of 50, one in three of us won't make it to the age of 75, and that's due to largely cardiovascular disease and cancer, but a number of others as well. And that's largely because what's been driving decision support over the last 30 years hasn't changed. It's a stethoscope, a reflex hammer, and a tongue depressor. If we want to know about our family history, your physician asks you what did mom and dad have. We need to move that to the next phase, the next generation, data-driven, measuring what matters, actually looking at all six billion base pairs of your whole genome, actually looking at your core with whole body MRI biomarkers and blood biomarkers, and helping the physician with AI and machine learning. 
So our health nuclear assessment is based on three data silos, imaging, genetics, and blood biomarkers. But the important concept is integrating all of that data together with AI, enabling the physician to offer a data-driven precision health assessment. And I'll end with this slide. Uh, and it almost seems cliche, right? Because we can all debate about you know, the 10 tenets of longevity. You all probably have uh, different uh, tenets than I have on this list. But I just want to focus on the top three. One is sleep. Uh, I would argue that all of these other tenants serve that one, because if you're not getting good sleep, you're not going to live to 100, you're not going to be a high-performing individual. Number two, Dan alluded to it, you are the new pill, right? If pills were working so great, why is our life expectancy for the first time in the last 40 years declining over the last three years? Uh, we've given up our power to the drug industry largely. Now, I'm a physician, so I know that there are extreme examples where pharmacotherapy is necessary, but for most of us, we're just at mildly increased or decreased risk for chronic age-related disease. Most of us need a program of action, not a pill. But number three is know your number, because if you're doing all the right things, and you're eating kale and practicing yoga, and you've got the right sleep regimen and the right diet and exercise, if you don't know that you have a BRCA mutation that's going to predispose you to breast or ovarian cancer in your 40s, it doesn't matter if you're doing all those other things. So we've got to measure what matters and know your number. Uh, and I'll close with this slide, uh, which is that medicine has historically been a clinical practice only sometimes supported by data. And I think it's moving pretty quickly to a data science uh, supported by clinicians. And I'll end with that. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. So quick, quick question. Yep. Amazing work. I've been through the scanner there. It takes Thank about an you. hour in the scanner. And, and 10 minutes later, we're watching my brain come out color-coded. Exactly. Um, is, where's the technology to make faster, more high-resolution scans? And then how to put all those pieces together, including your omics, proteome, genome, et cetera? Right. So when we started the assessment, Dan went through in our early years, the whole body MRI, which is now an hour, was two hours, right? So the scan time isn't, fast, you know, isn't falling as fast as Moore's Law, like whole genome sequencing costs. But we'll be down to a 20-minute whole body MRI uh, in about two years. Uh, you know, some of the major imaging vendors are moving to wellness scanners, the idea that we use you know, medical imaging, including MRI, not just for di diagnostic scanning, but actually for wellness. So we'll get to a point where you won't have to suffer for an hour of scan time. Great. Thanks, David. Thanks, Dan. Yeah.